Okay, it's 5.05, so I think we're about ready to get started. Um, so again, for those of you who just joined us, um, head over to this link that I just put in the chat, and we'll be working on two or three projects today, depending on if we have um, some extra time. But the first project we're going to start with is the My To-Do List. So this is going to take advantage of a new tool, um, which is TinyDB. So DB stands for database, and that basically lets us store stuff on our phone um, locally. So, you know, say you are just storing something like your notes, which you don't really need other people to access. Uh, you, it's good to use something like TinyDB in order to, um, uh, you know, keep it on your phone locally. So this is something that you can use because uh, when you are running something like App Inventor, you know, there's no direct uh, access to the files. Um, necessarily. So you can specify TinyDB in order to um, have that direct access. Uh, and as like an extension, this is a really important concept because, you know, say you're making like a website uh, or, you know, just in the general app and you want to upload, say, images you take, for example, um, or, you know, even going back to the Snapchat app uh, that we made yesterday. If you want to share those um, over the cloud, uh, for, for instance, it's helpful to have, you know, this type of database functionality that lets you transfer files and share them and store them as well. Um, so it's very useful and uh, MIT App Adventure makes it very easy for you guys to implement this on your own platform. So we'll start. Um, uh, could I have a uh, share screen privileges actually? Yeah, you have it. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll go here and we'll start with this screen. So um, from here, just make sure you can navigate to the page that is in the chat and just click my to-do list and you should be able to access the uh, screen here. Now this is a bit more comprehensive than the last two lectures. So, um, you know, we'll do our best to go a bit more slowly today. Uh, but again, if you have any questions and if you want to, uh, you know, slow down or stop uh, or even speed up, uh, don't hesitate to just unmute yourself and, you know, say it out loud or put it in the chat and we'll make sure to accommodate uh, as best as we can. So let's start with this. Um, we're going to be making a to-do list app and we're just basically keeping track of really basic tasks. Um, you know, for example, if you've ever kept a bullet journal uh, for school or another personal project, you can really keep and itemize a lot of the things you need to do and make sure uh, you can increase your productivity um, through this organization. So we're going to basically make this in MIT App Inventor. Uh, so to do this, we're going to basically be storing these uh, bullets in TinyDB. Okay, so, um, and this is like an example of uh, uh, the functionality at the end that we should be able to achieve. So let's start with the user interface. Um, uh, there, we're going to make something like this. Uh, so MIT App Inventor now doesn't give us any star code, although it used to um, in the uh, simpler projects. So we're going to have to make this from scratch. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we were going to want to create a field where users can enter a password um, and, you know, uh, basically log into the app. That's going to be one screen. Um, and then another screen is going to be the separate place where you can have most of the actual functionality. So we can build these two separately, basically. Um, and you know, you've know you probably seen places like this. All you have to do is make sure this password um, is matching to the password that we stored in the backend. Um, for more advanced applications, we can also do something called encryption, where we can actually encode the project and um, move it uh, to make sure that it can't be accessed uh, you know, by other people improperly. So uh, in this case, I don't think we're going to be doing this, but uh, that's something that you generally do as well. So let's start with the components here. Um, the first component we're going to look at is screen one. So um, we have the interface here as well as the components. Uh, and we're going to be, again, like I said, making two screens. So the first screen can be the actual password site. And then the second screen, uh, is going to be the actual place where we can add the notes. So let's follow the steps here. Um, and we can, uh, it, it says that we can uh, do it on our own, but we'll just go ahead and follow the tutorial since we're still learning the process. So let's start with screen one. Um, this screen one is going to be the password interface. So um, you can follow along with the videos here, uh, or you can just, of course, since we're here together, I just follow along with the Zoom here. But this is a good resource if you want to uh, work on this again, uh, or you know, maybe you missed something down the line uh, or you know, just to review uh, in the future. So 
and start with the password interface. Um, we'll start with uh, this first step here. Uh, we're going to go to layouts, get a vertical arrangement, and just put it under the screen one. Or actually, we have to put it here, and then it'll just show up under screen one. And from, from here, uh, the next thing is we want to go to the screen one here, and we can adjust the properties. So we go to align horizontal. We just control F this. And just do center and center for both. And then from the interface of the palette here, uh, we can uh, drag the vertical arrangement. Um, or excuse me, we also want to drag a uh, password label. So we'll search for this here. Actually, we want to just grab a general label. Drag this, I think, uh, in here. And then we can also drag in a uh, password text box, so just a general text box in here as well. Uh, we'll do this in there, yeah. And then we can also have a button. So the button can then fall inside of this box here. And you know, to make it closer to this example here, uh, or, or I guess not closer to the example, to make this a little prettier, we could center this and you know change the fonts as well as the font size. But for now, we'll just leave it like this and keep it simple. Um, so um, to reiterate, all we've done is we've gone to this layout page, uh, grab a vertical arrangement, and we've just set center for um, the uh, aligned horizontal and the line vertical. Um, and then from there, uh, we have also dragged into this vertical arrangement a label as well as a text box and a button. So um, the vertical arrangement, all that does is uh, and kind of like it hints out here, we're basically just creating this structure where we can fit other components in there um, in order to uh, make this more organized and also, you know, generally consolidated. So that helps um, when we're, you know, adding multiple parts that we want to kind of group together um, for the user to access. So that's all we will do uh, so far. Uh, what we'll actually also do is rename these um, just to these labels so we can access them with the proper label down the line. So uh, let's rename this. We'll rename this password label. You can rename this password text box. And they renamed the password text box one. So we'll just do the same thing. And here we can rename this password button. And again, you could technically do this without renaming it, but it's really handy so that when we go to the blocks here, we can access you know, these components and not have to double check you know, what is the difference between, say there's two text boxes, you know, password text box one, and then say like uh, the text box for the other screen, uh, which we're going to make. So this keeps this uh, you know, relatively uh, more organized. And it's generally a good practice to name things um, in a clear way for you know not only yourself but also for other people if they're looking at your code down the line say um, if you're working at a company or in general in a group setting so we'll go to the components property here and from here uh, it wants us to change the width property of the vertical arrangement to fit parent so we can you know make this wider so we'll just do that real quick so now it's uh, you know a bit more aesthetic in the sense that it fills up this entire section instead of just you know um, being like a small box uh, in the center here. And we can also change the align horizontal property um, to center as well, which I think actually should already be uh, the case. Um, so then we can also change the text property of uh, the label here. And we can uh, just change this to have a starter text. You know, this just makes it easier for the user to um, understand what to do. And we can change this to enter password and we can just keep it at that uh, as well. So um, this will just you know, tell the user what to do. And then from here, we can uh, change the text property of the button specifically um, into enter. And this basically you know, just submits it um, for the user. And in theory, we could also add text here as starter, like say like uh, place text here. Um, but you don't have to do this. Uh, because then the user will have to delete it, but it could just be another thing you do um, as like a stylistic choice. Um, but again, most of these are stylistic choices. Um, they won't make, make or break your application. Uh, it's mostly with the consideration of the end user in mind 
and making an app that is you know nav uh, easy to navigate. So um, we'll move on here, and we can rename the components uh, as we already have done, and we will move on to the next step here, which is step five. So um, for screen two, we just want to make a new screen. Uh, I think one thing we can do is actually duplicate this. Uh, okay, I actually don't remember the, the duplication with the screen specifically, but we can just add a screen here as well in tablet screen two. So screen two, as you can see, has a different interface. Um, so you can actually just toggle between screens here um, and change stuff as we go. Um, again, it's we have separate screens because we have two separate um, functions. We want to functions as in a functionality, as in you know not like a programming function, but uh, two different tasks is a better word to complete. Um, with the first screen being you know entering a password to double check the user uh, and. You know, I we're also um, having a second screen where we can actually have the note taking and storing functionality. So um, we'll move on to the second screen here. And again, all we did was just click on Add Screen, and we just have Screen Two here now. It should have also updated here in the blocks so that we can access uh, you know components in Screen Two. So it's more organized, and you know that lets us add more features without cl uh, cluttering one screen too much. So let's. Um, move on to the steps here. So with the component layout, uh, we've already added the screen here. We've already made sure screen two is selected. We can now here drag a label. This is gonna be our title, as it says, and we also have a text box. And here, it also wants us to add a horizontal arrangement. And it also wants us to drag um, three buttons into the horizontal arrangement. So one, two, and, oh, two, and three. Okay. Uh, actually, I think I misread that. It says from the layout drawer of the palette, drag and drop a horizontal arrangement, 43 buttons you'll need. Actually, no, it is correct as shown here. So then from the interface, it also wants us to drag that. We already did this. Finally, from the user interface of the palette, drag and drop a list view component. And this was just what it was, so right here. So we are following the uh, model that is shown here. And just double check everything that we haven't skipped anything. Uh, all we've done so far is we've added a screen. We've added a label at the top, which is gonna be the title, a text box to enter stuff, uh, three buttons for functionality that we're going to also define down the line. Um, and we also have a list view, which will just display the tasks once we have uh, added them. So we have something in the chat here. Um, uh, actually, never mind, I misread that. Um, but you know, in general, uh, we want to just do this uh, to, give the functionality. So it's a clever design. But um, we'll pause here just for a second to make sure everyone's caught up. Uh, does any, anyone have any questions or any issues they've run into so far? Or any clarifications as well for why we're doing this and why we have multiple screens? Okay, um, so we'll just keep going then um, and continue with the tutorial. So from here, we can adjust the properties um, again, like we did earlier to make this a lot prettier. So here we'll take screen two and we'll again, like we did last time, change this to center. Uh, we can actually just leave that alone. We can change this to the actual title we want. We'll just call it a uh, to do. Actually, yeah, we'll just keep it a uh, to do list. And even just here, we can label this as like to-do list as well. So to get another screen, Russell, all you have to do is come up here to the top here and just click add screen. So um, we, I'll just do it again, screen three. And it just gives you a new um, interface here that you can access. And if you accidentally added a new, an extra screen, you can also just remove it here. And I actually don't want to check points.
Okay, perfect. So let's keep with the tutorial. Uh, how were you able to place the buttons together from left to right? Uh, I've placed them vertically. Um, so did you pick a horizontal arrangement um, instead of a vertical arrangement? Okay, um, I think generally, let's actually just test this out to see. Uh, when you have a horizontal or vertical arrangement, it puts things vertically. Maybe you could put it on the side. I don't think it gives an option. Yeah, I think if you have a uh, horizontal arrangement, it should uh, be putting things horizontally, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, do you want to share your screen just to see um, the thing as well? Because maybe some other students are also experiencing the same issue. OK, sounds good. OK, so um, I think we are actually missing an arrangement. So we'll slow down a bit. Um, because I think, sorry, I'm uh, skipping over things a little too quickly. Uh, but one thing is um, you should be able to go to the layout and to make it center aligned. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll go come back to that in just a second, Russell. Um, but we go to get a horizontal arrangement and you can just drag the horizontal arrangement to the screen. Um, and then you should be able to drag those buttons back in. Uh, you can, it's probably easier just to put the text for the button, um, or excuse me, drag the button and kind of like drag it right until it lets you uh, show like a, um, a blue line to the right of the previous button. So we don't actually need another horizontal arrangement, so you could just uh, drag that back. Um, but for button two, you could just grab onto button two and then drag it into the existing horizontal arrangement and just like uh, move your cursor to fit inside of the horizontal arrangement. So it should let you, yeah, just drag and drop into it, just like that. Okay, perfect. Um, and one thing you can do is if you click on horizontal arrangement, I think if you press fill parent, it should uh, give some better formatting instead of going off the page there for width uh, specifically. So yeah, it is, a. Uh, Still going off a bit, but still better than what it was before. I um, mean, one thing you might also add is actually a text um, component just at the very top. Uh, so we can name the app um, for the users. And uh, so with the buttons on the screen, uh, here, let me just share my screen again. So the buttons on the screen, uh, I think it's actually not really supposed to go off the screen here because we made this uh, just fill the parent. I think, uh, yeah, um, I think it's, it, it is technically in the screen. It's just that we have like this sidebar here that uh, cuts off this part, but it doesn't really yeah. impact the functionality. So what we can That's do fine. is- uh, And also when you deploy it on your mobile phone, it should be fine. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, yeah, it okay. uh, should be good. But anyways, um, again, we can come back at the end and kind of beautify things, but we'll aim for functionality for the time being. Uh, but just to kind of reiterate what we've been doing so far, to center a line of text box in general, uh, you can click on that component and um, there should be an option for text alignment like center uh, or also stuff like, um, uh, it, it can also give you like, you know, stuff like width and height, height excuse me, which can also uh, give an issue in terms of alignment. Generally, the best way to do it is just to fill parent because um, that gives you like the prettiest, you know, edge to edge. Uh, display instead of you know giving making it say like partial on like the top left of the screen um, and for some components it also lets you to center lets you center it um, directly in the screen like uh, with the horizontal arrangement so like if we did this here actually this won't do it because it's already filled but if we had something uh, like this vertical arrangement here uh, we can change the alignment here which I think changes the alignment of stuff inside here so um, could have something like this. And actually, we'll just skip over this demonstration because it's kind of uh, extraneous, but 
that's basically um, how you can change what are the uh, uh, layout overall. And no problem, Russell. Um, and just to make sure everyone's caught up, um, to up to this point, we have uh, have a screen one. And all you need to have done for this screen is have a vertical arrangement. Um, and you just want this vertical arrangement to be aligned. Uh, you can align it basically with center, center, um, and horizontally, uh, and also vertically. And from here, you can have a password label. All that is is basically you know text that you can't modify. And that text will tell the user to enter a password. So we could even say enter password to access uh, the notes. And that would just update it there. And then we also have a text box where the user can you know, uh, type in stuff. And then you know, we can check if it's the right password. In this case, we want to leave this blank um, just for convenience. And we also have a password button where once this is pressed, and as we covered in the last two days in our crash course, once you press this as an event handler, it'll perform another action. In this case, check if that password matches an existing password that we've defined in the device. Um, for more advanced functionality, one thing you could consider is if you're making an app of your own, it would be pretty cool to actually uh, look up encryption techniques. So encryption is when you take, you know, normal text, say the password is like banana, and you turn banana into something that is more difficult to decipher. So in decipher as in, you know, uh, interpret. Uh, and we want to do that so that if someone somehow got access to the uh, backend password, um, or, you know, the password in between, you know, being able to take it in and check it, they wouldn't be able to as easily understand it, even if they intercepted that message somehow. Um, so that provides an additional level of security, uh, which is very important because, you know, if you, maybe you're storing very sensitive information on your database, say like uh, people's banking information or people's addresses, uh, in that case, you really want to make sure that your data is private. Um, I'm sure you've seen stuff on the news, companies like Robinhood, I think even recently Heroku, uh, which is part of Salesforce, they've had data breaches and, you know, it's just not very pretty. Consumers get mad and um, data is lost and that could lead to a lot of criminal activity. Uh, center align for the button. Um, I think if you're centering aligning uh, the text, it should ch change uh, slightly. Like you can kind of see it shift a bit. Um, yeah, it, it kind of just aligns the button on it only. You, it, to align the button itself, uh, generally you want to go here, I think, and do it. Let me make sure that that is what it's doing. Uh, bottom, actually, this is not going to do anything because we just sent it. In. Yeah, so if you want to center the button in the actual component uh, for align horizontal, you know, all that means is with respect to the width, we want it to, to start in the middle. You can kind of think of that as in like you have a Google Doc or Word document and you have the option to center the text um, in the document. Uh, it's like the same idea in terms of where we are you know, positioning it. So just to demonstrate that visually. Again, all this stuff is stylistic. Um, we're aiming mostly for functionality regardless. So we can come back and change the appearance of this to make this prettier. Uh, for example, we could even uh, turn this bigger. Uh, that's a little too big. This will do 18 actually. Um, and even change this to say like a pretty green color. Actually, that's a... Uh, uh, maybe better to do it like blue. Yeah. So we can all change this later. Everything here gives uh, good um, options, but <clears throat> overall, we're just aiming for functionality. So to go back to screen two, and just to reiterate uh, what we've done with screen two, we have a label here at the top, which is just, you know, our title, basically a text box where users can input stuff. In this case, it's um, going to be like the actual tasks in the bullet list. We have a horizontal arrangement where we can add the buttons, drag them one by one, and then you know users can basically click on these buttons for additional functionality. In this case, let's move button uh, three here. Actually, it's easier to do this just to make sure it's in order. Um, we also have a list view which should be able to then display um, all of our added uh, tasks once we code that functionality. So. Let's go here again um, and follow the steps one more time. Align horizontal should be center. We want to change the text property of this specific label one to the um, to-do list, just to title it. I see some stuff in the chat. Uh, you have to adjust the screen settings in screen one 
Uh, my vertical arrangement is at the top. How do I fix that? Yeah, so um, if you want that to change, uh, we'll just demonstrate that. You go to screen one here, and you change this to a uh, center here. So it could be a top, bottom. We want it to be center. So to provide some intuition on uh, general strategies to change these things, um, usually if you want to change stuff like formatting, you can just click on that specific item that you want to change and just you know click on stuff here to alter it. Um, so you know, let's say we want this to, uh, we'll give another example. Um, Let's just make another blank screen. And let's say, you know, we want, we have like a, uh, a text box here. And we actually want this to be very here in the center. So to do that, uh, intuitively, um, we can figure this out by, you know, thinking about how we want to uh, make that with respect to what we have. The only components we have here are like a screen and a text box. So we know we have to change stuff in the screen. Um, and then, or the text box in order to modify the design. So, you know, let's just start with the text box. Is there anything here that would actually make move this text box to the center? So, background color, no. On size, no. Height, uh, let's, let's just see. Fill parent, oh no, it doesn't work. It's filling the actual text box screen completely. So, we leave that. With would do the same thing. So, then, you know, intuitively, we have to go to the screen here and we could test these out. In this case, we can you know try this out, and we realize that uh, the alignment on the screen is actually what moves this text box. So that um, you know then solves our issue. So uh, let's type this in again and move back to screen two. Okay, so we're back to screen two. Um, we want to also change the width property now of the text box to fill parent. And again, all this is doing when it says fill parent is we have this text box um, and we are basically telling App Inventor to render it so that it goes from the left edge to the right edge. So then it, it fills up this width completely. Now, if you wanted this text box like we showed uh, just a second ago to fill it up from top to bottom, what we could do is change heights to fill parent. So then it would uh, reach until the very bottom. In this case, this is in the way, so it reaches as far as it can go until this hits the bottom. Um, but we don't want that, so we'll leave this to automatic. <clears throat> so from here, we can also change the height property of the list view. And again, if we want to change it to that specific, uh, change that property of that specific component, the easiest way to access that is to either, you know, click on it, or we can go here and tap on it here. And honestly, uh, if you're just looking for it and you have a lot of components, it might be easier to just uh, search for it on the sidebar uh, by name. So we have the list view one. We want this to change the height to fill parent as well. And all that's doing is, um, you know, kind of like it shows here, uh, what it would do is it would- um, Central center. So actually I want this to mute, but we would um, have this, you know, fill top to bottom uh, because we can show all the tasks then in a larger display basically, um, instead of, you know, showing them in a very small, uh, one line thing that we had before. So um, we don't want to have the user scroll, you know, through this here uh, to see everything, you know, since we have all this dead space anyways, we can just uh, show it on this much larger uh, real estate. So that's why we do that. And we can now change the text property here of the three buttons to the functions we want them to do. Um, of course, this isn't actually going to change the functionality. We still have to code that in the block section which again, we referred to yesterday as the back end and this as the front end, you know, back end for brains, front end for face is the way I remember it. Uh, no worries, Jack, see you later um, and have a nice day. So we are um, uh, going to just title these basically to label them um, as our intended functions. And then down the line, we can actually code the functions themselves. Function as in the tasks, uh, I'll rephrase that uh, to avoid confusion. So from here, <clears throat> we can refine some of the properties. Uh, so we'll go to text box and it wants us to give a hint. So let's we'll enter a list of items. And then um, for the shape of the button, you can change it to rounded just to look prettier. 
Where is it? Should shape here. It should. Okay, awesome. Um, and then we can also change these colors to uh, different colors just to differentiate them. Um, one consideration as well, although this likely wasn't the necessarily the intended consideration, is uh, if you're designing an app for accessibility, you want to make sure that um, you know people. Um, let's say they have you know some visual impairment. Um, you want them to be able to easily dis distinguish all of these functions, even if say it's very difficult for them to read um, the text, uh, you know, exactly. So um, in general, if you can color code things properly, have good contrast, it makes it easier for, you know, other uh, individuals who may not be able to, you know, uh, see as well as others to access the app and use it uh, more easily. Um, so we'll go down here, we've already done this. Again, most of the changes we're doing right now are stylistic. It doesn't impact the functionality that much, but um, it does impact the user's experience. So uh, that is also something to consider when making apps, um, you know, beyond just the MIT App Inventor projects is, you know, just because something works doesn't mean that it'll work uh, well for the end user because you want to make sure that it's simple to use. Um, you know, you can't just make something with like a super complicated interface and expect everyone to use it, obviously. Um, I think even in my own experience, I like tried deploying stuff and like tell like have a Google Doc of instructions on how to use it. And people just um, maybe like don't do it sometimes because it's too complicated. So simplicity is key a lot of the times. Um, so we'll change the horizontal uh, or align horizontal property to center. Uh, we've already done that here. Um, but we also want to change the width here to fill parent. We've already done that. Um, and we can also change the width buttons of the, uh, or the width properties of the three buttons to 30%. Um, honestly, we don't have to do this, but uh, again, this is stylistic. And this will allow us to have a slightly more well formatted app. And from here, we can also change the text size of the list view. So again, to access list view, you can just click on this here. You can also click on the others to access them. Um, and we can provide the text size to 30 to make this more legible. Okay, so then we'll now work on the TinyDB component. And just a refresher for what TinyDB is, TinyDB allows you to store files locally uh, more or less on your system. If you want a more in-depth explanation, you can click on this. Um, it's a bit long-winded, but uh, intuitively, you can just remember that if you want to store stuff locally and you don't necessarily want people to access it outside of you know, the actual user, uh, you, TinyDB is generally a better fit. Um, you can think about this as you know just storage on your phone, whereas CloudDB, as like the name suggests, has storage on the cloud. So the cloud lets you access it from a remote place, you know, not necessarily just the device where you made or you know, save that file. Um, so that can also enable uh, sharing across devices. And that also implies sharing across users. Um, you know, that is very convenient, but of course you don't necessarily always want that functionality because that can lead files to becoming exposed. Um, and you know, you're basically storing it on someone else's server or basically a computer. So if something happens to that server, say, you know, uh, this is a very simplified example, but there's like a tsunami or something and it floods out the entire server. Then in theory, you could lose access to all those files. So whenever you store something, say on iCloud or Google Drive, you're trusting that the company like Google will be around you know, forever and also uh, secure your files so that you don't have to worry about losing them. Um, so that's actually one thing that's interesting because uh, I think Pinterest was bought out by some company, was it like Verizon, I don't remember. Uh, quite sure. But um, one thing that they did when they, I think, got acquired again was they were like deleting a bunch of people's photos. So they had like, I think a year or so, maybe less to uh, recover all those photos and save them by themselves. But, you know, people, I think, you know, generally just assume these photos would be around forever, which isn't the case. Um, so interesting to consider, um, probably not very relevant for our, our lesson or, you know, our daily lives. But uh, if, since we're young, you know, we're going to be around for, you know, in theory, 70 plus more years, it could be something that matters a lot more down the line. Um, and it could be an interesting, you know, problem to tackle. 
uh, if you're interested in fixing stuff. Elon Musk. Um, Elon Musk, I think, tried to acquire Twitter. I don't remember what happened there, honestly. I mean, maybe he also did Pinterest, I don't recall. Um, but anyways, we'll move on to the getting the tiny DB. Um, and we're just storing this stuff in the to-do list. So this is one of those non-visible components that we talked about, I think, two days ago. You know, it doesn't show up as something we can click on, but it is there. It is just uh, working in the background. Um, so we'll just drag it on there. And uh, you can watch this video if you want to learn more. But honestly, we'll just uh, move on. And from here, like we're talking about, it's good to always rename your stuff um, to make it clear on what it actually does. You know, if you just call something button one, you really don't know what button one is. Um, it's easy to confuse button one, which is supposed to uh, enter an item with the erase item. And you know, who knows, you can make a careless mistake when choosing them in the block section. So what we'll do is just real quickly here, uh, relabel this as a title label. Relabel this as a to-do text box. We can relabel button one as enter item button. You can relabel this as erase item button. And we can take this as clear all button. And we can take this and rename it as uh, to do list view. Now we'll take a quick pause here just to make sure everyone's caught up. Um, and all we've done so far is we have made two screens. Screen one, which just takes in a password. And uh, screen two, which has all the front end uh, for the buttons and also the text box and this to-do list view. So make sure that your stuff looks like this here on the right, that you have all the components and that they're labeled properly. If you have minor differences in design, it's not really a big deal. We can always come back and change that. We just wanna make sure it works first. Um, but from here, you know, you can just make sure it looks like this, more or less, you know, and then this should also look like, your stuff should also look like this, more or less. So here it wants us to test it, so we'll just do that. Um, let me connect the tablet here, but this also give you a good time to catch up uh, if you are falling slightly behind. Um, of course, this app is not going to work, though, uh, because we haven't coded anything to tell it what to do. But it should give us, you know, some assurance that, you know, the, it doesn't crash when we're trying to load what it looks like. So uh, allow me to reconnect my device to my computer. Uh, it seems to have disconnected. But in the me meantime, I guess we can also just talk about um, what y'all's, if you all, y'all, what am I saying? If you guys have any ideas for like what you want to build. Um, for the hackathon. So like, do you guys have any specific areas of interest, you know, stuff that you've always thought about building, but, um, you know, didn't really know how to do until now. Uh, I remember when I was younger, I always like had these big ideas, but I never knew how to do any of it. So um, it would always, you know, take longer. Um, also my tablet just crashed. So we'll just let it reload for the time being. Um, but we'll just, I think, assume safely that this should load because uh, we haven't really done anything that should break the device so far. Um, and actually, has anyone uh, successfully loaded it onto their device so far? Aiden, maybe? Uh, like, was everything working OK? Uh, yeah. OK, perfect. And Sophia said yes as well. Awesome. OK, so then we'll just move on and let this tablet here uh, run its course. So again, the tiny DB, uh, the main differentiator uh, is you can think about it as it just stores locally, whereas cloud DB stores in the cloud. And uh, you know, functionally, what this really means is that this only lets one device access, where this lets multiple device devices access. In this case, the reason why we want tiny DB over cloud DB is because we want users well, only one device to access the stuff locally. Um, and, you know, there's really no need for other people to access the uh, files on the cloud. Um, although, you know, in theory, you could add that functionality if you really wanted to, um, you know, say, I'm sure you guys have used stuff like 
uh, Google Docs where you can share uh, documents you know, with other people. Um, I guess one corollary actually uh, to explain is uh, you can think about TinyDB as like uh, Microsoft Word. It's like local to your computer and you can't share it that easily without, you know, I guess saving it and sending it as an email or something. Whereas CloudDB is like Google Docs, you know, it's easier to collaborate um, and share stuff. Um, so here is uh, the introduction. Um, the This block is just letting you store the values locally, you know, it, and what a tag is, is basically an identifier. Um, let's actually look at the formal definition. But uh, you can think about a tag as, uh, you know, it's 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 basically the tag that you're giving it to identify down the line. Um, is really the best way to think about it. Uh, is your um? I think your screen's not shared if you're trying to show us. Oh, any. so sorry. I have made that mistake uh, a few times. So sorry about that. Um, I haven't really showed anything um, thus far except the. Uh, let's just click on this, and uh, the tags are basically you know what you're calling it, your label in a way. Uh, so that you can access it down the line. Um, so that's useful because uh, if you're tagging stuff, you can just use that tag specifically. It's like calling it by name in a way. Um, so then here we can also get the value, uh, specify a tag. You know, if, if it doesn't exist, then you just you know you can give a substitute value instead. Uh, and then here we are just calling um, to clear the content in the memory associated with that tag. You can think about the tag as like almost like an address. So, you know, you can change the stuff in that address. Um, maybe in, instead of an address, you can think about it as like an empty space in a cubby with like a specific address attached to that. So you could like add stuff to your cubby. You could like take stuff, uh, take stuff out. You can swap out the contents. Um, it's kind of like a space there. And that tag is just, you know, I'll give another uh, analogy here. Uh, like it's maybe it's just like your name in preschool with your cubby. So you can like take stuff out, you know, just, look for your cubby with your name on it and uh, uh, modify it. So from there, this will clear everything um, associated with that database. This is the dangerous to call, um, but if you want to just a fresh restart, it could be useful. Um, let me charge this tablet. I think it's starting to go into a software update for some reason, um, but it should be okay. And you can also read this as well if you have some time. But anyways, we will move on. <clears throat> we will go back to screen one and add some more functionality. Um, so we'll go back to the blocks here. And what we want to do is actually make the password button. Uh, it wants us to try it on our own, but honestly, since this is more educational, we'll just go through the tutorial. Um, but what we wanted to do is uh, let the user pick a password. And um, if the password uh, matches a password that we pick um, in the uh, basically just in the background here, then we will allow the user to enter the app and access the notes. And of course, this adds a layer of security in a way. So you don't want everyone to be up on your business knowing what you're, I guess, writing about. Say you're writing like some top like Nobel Prize winning thesis or something. Uh, you don't want other people to take that. So a password is a good uh, first line of defense in that case. So uh, we can also uh, make it so that if the password is wrong, then the password text box will be cleared. And one thing we could also do is actually tell the user that the password is wrong. I'm not sure if this actually gives that functionality, but uh, it's very easy. You can just say like reset this to say that like your password was incorrect. So just like set this text value like we did in projects yesterday. So all we want to do here is it wants us to uh, uh, take these blocks. So we'll just do control. And just think about it logically instead of always trying to uh, take you know what it is telling us a uh, hundred percent. So uh, what we'll actually do is we'll take the uh, passer button, and when you click on the passer button, again the passer button is just this thing that says enter. So when the user clicks enter, we want to pick the password. Um, so only when this event occurs, do we does this uh, event handler actually execute this stuff? Um, just to clarify. So we'll take this um, and we can add an if statement again. And actually, uh, let's call someone out on the audience to see what you guys think um, with this as a hint. So um, Leon, actually, if you're still there, uh, what do you think we could put here to check if the password matches? 
I think if like if the like enter text is this, then switch to screen two, else just like say wrong password or just like stay on the screen. Yes, perfect. That is uh, completely correct. Um, so we can basically, you know, we'll just go through the logic. All we want to do, like Leon said, is uh, check if this password that the users entered, which we can actually just grab by, you know, clicking this. Uh, let me make sure it is, yeah, password text box one. And uh, we have like the dot text uh, here, which all it, this is doing is if a user enters something here, it grabs uh, the value text specific uh, to this uh, text box. So, you know, even if we predefined a text, say we said the password is password, it would still grab whatever is here. Um, but of course, MIT App Inventor lets the user change this up by, by themselves as well. So we have functionality there. But you know, we will do that. Uh, and all we're doing here is we can specify a string, or you know, in this case, text as MIT App Inventor calls it, and call it a password like password, for example, um, and just compare it with the simple equals operator, um, which is right here. Again, in other languages, you can't generally just do equals. You have to use another function like a string compare. Um, but MIT App Inventor makes it nice and simple to compare strings which is awesome. Um, but anyways, let's move uh, on to the implementation. So we'll just go to the solution here and get it out of the way. So if this equals that, then you just want to open another screen, screen two. Otherwise, you just uh, clear the text box. So uh, we'll do that here. Go back to math. And we'll just use the same password they did. When uh, actually, I think we, one thing we'll have to double check, I forgot what MIT App Inventor defines this as, is uh, uh, sometimes you have the difference between like, right, right uh, excuse me, they define this here as just a regular number, say an integer, right? Um, if we define this as a string, I think it should still work just because MIT App Inventor simplifies it. Um, but in other languages, generally, uh, that's why you need this separate string compare uh, so that you can compare what is text, you know, text version of one, two, three, uh, compared to the number version of one, two, three, and not one, two, three, sorry, one, two, three, four. So if we do that. Let's grab it again. So we'll follow the example, do one, two, three, four here, and go back to the property associated with this text box. and take text. <clears throat> and so then we can also um, call us to open the screen. So click on screen one, and you should be able to just do open screen, I believe, unless I am tripping out. Uh, it's I in the control. Control, okay, sorry, yeah. my bad. Open screen, and you can just open screen two actually. Okay, perfect. And then you can go here and also set the password text box one and set this text uh, to blank text. And uh, again, oh, wait, sorry. Sorry, sorry, never mind. I, I was just looking for open another screen. Also, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was, also, I had my, name is, my name is Leon, not Leon. Just <laughs> sorry. Uh, Leon, my bad, my bad. Um, I apologize. Uh, I sometimes put your name just because. Uh, I just hear it badly, I guess. I was, I was never great at learning languages either. So um, um, maybe that's a completely unrelated, but I'm sorry about that, uh, Leon. That's fine. Uh, but uh, we'll just move on here. And we to reiterate, we just have the same functionality that they uh, listed here. We're just comparing whatever we type into this text box with a predetermined password, which we could really just you know, decide as anything. We could even define this as like, like, you know, uh, uh, QWERTY or something and compare it or, you know, some random string of digits. This is actually not a really good practice, um, again, because you're exposing the password as uh, raw text. So, you know, whoever has edit access um, to this will just know the password and see it. Uh, generally, you either want to, you know, obscure it somehow, you know, by encryption or one thing you could do is uh, set like an environment name uh, like a variable name on your system so that whenever you call, you know, something like, 
uh, like a specific variable name that you define like bar or like one or something, it just substitutes that value. Um, instead of, you know, it actually giving the true value, which in this case could be one, two, three, four, basically, you know, covers it up like that. Uh, but anyways, since this is uh, just for the sake of concepts, uh, we will leave this as one, two, three, four and not do any of the additional steps. Although if you wanted to make a hackathon project and showcase your um, security skills, that would be cool as well. So we'll go to screen two now. Oh, yeah. What's up? Yeah, is it possible to make like something where you have like a certain amount of tries before the screen locks for like a certain amount of time? Yes, that's a good idea and a good observation. So you could uh, set a global variable. Uh, this is just one implementation. I'm sure there are others, but you can initialize a global variable as like tries. And then, and then it's like every time um, it's like in the else and then you subtract one and you can make something like if tries equal zero, then switch to the screen. Right, yeah, exactly. That is, uh, uh, well, wait, sorry. Wait, could you repeat that one part? I, you know, I kind of- It was uh, like- if tries equals like, uh, it was like um, tries has like an initial starting value, like three or something. And then in the else you could put like subtract like one from tries every time or something. Um, uh, you could subtract if you wanted to reward them, I think for, or, or yeah, sorry, you could, you're right. My bad, I misunderstood. So yeah, like, like you said, you could have three here, for example, for the total number of tries. I was thinking about it additively, just like cap it if it equals three, but yeah, you could do it the other way around. Yeah. Um, if you, you could start with zero, you know, and like you said, or sorry, start with three. And if it ever equals zero here, then you can, uh, lock them out. So what you, one thing you could do is, uh, set another is That's give another happy. screen. Yeah. Yeah. That was what I was going to. Mm -hmm. So that is perfect. A uh, really good observation there, Leon. And, um, and, uh, um, will be something you could implement on your own as well. Uh, but it is already 557. Uh, I want to give you guys your five minute break. So we'll come back at around 602. Um, we're almost done with this. Um, everything else here is not terribly uh, bad or anything. So we'll finish this up and then we'll come back and uh, work on the other project as well, which the, is the opinion poll app. So, um, you know, enjoy your five minutes off and we will get back together at 602. And Leon, oh, excuse me, sorry. Leon, do you still have a question? Uh, so your hand is raised. Oh, no, sorry, that was going to be my question. Uh, no worries. Okay, perfect. See you guys later.
Okay, welcome back. Um, so yeah, if someone's locked out, you can set a timer. I think there's like a clock or something in MIT and Op Inventor. Let's uh, share my screen. Um, I think it might be under, it's somewhere here. You can search it. Is there a search here? Uh, I think so. Squirrel app. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, I mean, I'm, I, I'm oh, sure timer, that timer, timer is in the designer. Oh, okay. Uh, shoot. Okay. So then search timer time, time picker. Uh, and there's also just a clock. So Sorry. you can probably Google it. There is a timer, uh -huh. timer. Isn't it? No. No. Okay. I think there's a yeah, time. Yeah, clock. Oh, yeah. Um. So clock. Uh. It's just it gives you the time. Um. You could probably just like. Uh. I mean, this is there's probably a better way to do this. One thing you could do is just grab time at that point, and then just like, say if the time equals that time plus like five or whatever five seconds, then just like reshow the screen one or something. Uh, that's like a very simple, like rudimentary way of doing it. Um, but there's probably other ways of doing it as well. Um, but that's probably like the most straightforward. Um, so we'll now go here and uh, initialize a variable to do list, which will crop, uh, take care of any, everything, excuse me, um, that we have in the list. Uh, there's one of the sensors apparently too, according to Russell's. Russell, excuse me, I keep mispronouncing stuff. Um, so we'll just do this and label this as to do list <laughs> and just create an empty list, uh, which is going to be useful down the line. Um, so what it wants us to do is when we initialize screen two, uh, you can get the my to do list tag and then store its value in the to do list variable and then set the elements of the list view to the uh, to-do list variable as well. So do you guys have uh, any ideas, any volunteers for uh, how you can implement this? And uh, I guess you could technically look at that, but um, anybody with uh, any novel ideas on how to do this? Wait, what are we, um, sorry, what are we trying to achieve? My internet kind of cut out for a little bit. No worries. Uh, basically, uh, what are some ideas? What kind of code box could you use to um, perform this or make this happen? Get my to do list tag from tinyDB and store its value in the to do list variable. Select the elements of the list view component. Wait, so when screen two pops up, you need to get, get something and store the value in the to do list variable. Can you like put this thing in list? Uh, which thing? Oh, oh, sorry, can you do like when this thing is like when screen two is opened, put like the tag. Yeah, when screen two dot initialize, put the tag in. Um, put the get, get my to do list tag and put it in like the list or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like so, if you send the chat, you could start with like the initialize and then get the tag. Uh, my to do list tag, and then use like the existing functionality that we already learned here. Um, and just put the tag here for uh, whatever we want to achieve. So yeah, set global to list too. So yeah, you guys, most of you got it. Uh, this is basically what it wants us to do. We want to initialize it. And then we want to uh, basically redefine the to-do list uh, list that we've already gotten. And what this is doing is this is like creating one, you can think about it as like one instance of uh, whatever is being stored locally already. So we can just update this value to modify every time. So we of course want to call the get value function, which has already been made for us by the folks as uh, tinydb slash MIT and just tag, get the tag my to-do list, um, which we've already created. And then, you know, if nothing is there, then we just want to create an empty list uh, for that tag. Um, and actually, I think it's just basically just assigning this tag in general. Uh, and we can create an empty list uh, if this 
tag it doesn't really refer to anything. Um, so then we can then set the to do list view dot elements, which uh, again was um, already defined uh, to the variable that we have uh, assigned this value that we grab. Um, I think we can, and Dr. McCurry, if I'm wrong, but we could probably just, in theory, just uh, cut out this global to do list and put this uh, here, at least just for this by itself, right? Uh, no, you have to type it. You cannot copy it. Is that what you're asking? Or we could just uh, remove, just ignore the variable and technically put this purple thing inside here. Oh, I think okay. We want to be able to modify it locally is why we do this. I, I we'll just follow this for now. But I think uh, the reason why MIT App Inventor wants us to do it like this is so that we can grab this and just change it locally without changing the database uh, version. Because um, oh, this is uh, when screen is initiate initialized. So this is the first time you you want to grab a an existing list to the right. to your local. Right. So, yeah, yeah, but I guess what, what I was thinking is just isolating this and no other functionality, we could in theory just skip the local and just put this here. Like, uh, uh, when, wait, I am trying, when this initializes, uh, we just set, what do we set again? To do list view. That elements. And we could just uh, just call this directly and put this here instead of. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. Okay. I think the reason why we wanted to set it locally is. Um, yeah, I, I guess in the future, you're probably going to use that. It's, right. Well, later on, you're going to use that list. You don't want to call that uh, the cloud, uh, retrieve the cloud data every time. So right. it's good to save it to, to a local list. Right. Um, so the reason for that is it can get expensive if your say cloud provider charges you every time for an access. Um, another thing is it's just like unnecessary. If you could just store it once, um, it'll save you uh, time. Uh, and another thing is if you were modifying it locally, um, it is safer and then you know you can then upload it at the end if you want to make changes uh, instead of trying to say modify directly through the cloud without having a local instance um, yeah i agree with you this saves a lot of uh, io time which mm -hmm. is input output time uh so we'll do this here um and that's like why we set this variable is like the intuition um uh because in theory at least for this by itself we could have just put the purple but th there's like a reason is um, what I was trying to explain. Uh, so we'll take this here, uh, call it the tiny db1. That give uh, the, the, the wrong thing. Wait, sorry, what component is tiny db1? So tiny db1 is a non visible component. Um, right. So uh, again, that just means that it won't show up here, uh, but it's just there for us to access. So oh. TinyDB allows us to access the files locally on oh. your phone. Yeah, sorry, I didn't have that piece, so I was... No worries. Okay. Um, I guess since we have some time then, um, also make sure that you guys have all these pieces before we proceed. So give like 10 seconds there. And moving back on here. Um, we are running slightly short on time. We're going to go through two projects. So um, I, I won't speed up too much here, but just... Uh, to keep in mind. So uh, we'll, we'll call tinyDB1 uh, and get the, I did the same mistake again. We want to get the value, sorry. And then we define a tag. And the tag in this case was my to-do list. And uh, that is should be all. I don't think we skipped over anything. So yeah, perfect. So move this back here. And let's move on to the next step here. So it's screen two now, which is the same screen. Uh, we want to uh, define what happens when they enter an item. So 
uh, we have the item in the to do text box. Um, or what we want to do is the item in to do text box, uh, which is here. So the item that the user is entering, we want to um, add this to the list in to do list, which is the variable we defined here. And then we want to update tinyDB uh, in, the, in, the, in the local device storage um, in order to um, make that uh, updated, basically. So we're basically changing it in the instance of the variable. And then uh, from there, since we're changing the variable, we can actually just take that value uh, and then just update that value to the uh, local database. So the reason for this is basically it allows us to make changes easier because we can just then um, redefine this uh, uh, and update it to the update it locally in TinyDB by just referring to this variable name. Um, so, okay, uh, but yeah, I think we'll just uh, keep continuing. And again, please, you know, uh, without don't want to rush or anything. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to speak up. Like. Leon's been doing really amazingly uh, just to make sure that everyone is uh, up to speed and that we're answering all the questions. Um, but, and if I'm also explaining things in like an unclear way, also just let me know uh, and we can go over it again. Um, but then from here, we can have uh, the list view component. Basically, we're just updating this to display the new stuff. And we can also contain the latest entry item as well. Um, it's telling us to, do it on our own, but honestly, I think we can get more intuition by just showing it since we're still learning. So uh, we can, when we click on the enter item button, so in this case, <clears throat> it is uh, this button here, enter item, the first green button. That is an event handler that wants us to call, um, you know, this specific functionality that we've defined here. So in this case, we take the list, uh, to-do list that we've defined, and we are taking the item uh, to do text box that text, which is basically that uh, to do item that we have defined, or excuse me, the user has typed in, and all we're doing that is appending or actually adding that to this existing list. So for intuition, when a user types in something here, basically, then we want to take that value, add it to this local list, uh, and then we want to actually update uh, the tiny DB with this global to do list. And the reason why this is helpful for tiny DB, which is local is because we can just modify to-do list as like our temporary variable in a way. And just whenever we modify that and we're done, we can just set the value um, to update uh, as uh, this variable name, which refers to all the changes we've made basically, or like an updated version. Uh, so that just keeps things nice and tidy for us. Um, and we'll, we'll basically whatever we do to to-do list in this case, in theory, uh, can just be updated. Um, based on the code we already have. So you don't have to like keep track of, uh, say like uh, having to call this example multiple times. Uh, well, not exactly. Anyways, I guess the way to think about this is the reason why we define this separately so we can make changes. Um, it's like the easiest way to put it. Um, but regardless, we'll go to enter item button. We'll go to add items to the list. Define this list. So. We'll get the variables, get to-do list, and we want to add the, the value from this text box again. And we're just gonna add this to this list. And then from here, we are calling uh, the store value, and this is just updating the latest uh, we are using the same tag, so it's just going to override it basically and take the uh, value of the updated list and just replace it. Oh, awesome, Russell, that you've created that working timer thing. That's really cool. Um, maybe at the end, if we have some time, you could show it to the class. But, anyways, we can go back to TinyDB, uh, call the store value, and then just add the tag as well as the value of the list. Uh, yeah, my to do list. <clears throat> so now we can also 
uh, update the actual visual elements. So we're just setting the to-do list view, which is what we see again in the text box. Uh, we're resetting that. So we'll go to set. So let me do the other stuff. Nope. So we set this and this. The text as well as the elements to pull to do list, in this case, an empty text slash string. So it matches. And again, what this does is when we're clicking on the button, it takes into the event. And we want to then uh, take the list and take the list variable specifically that we've called from lo the local file storage and then add the new item to it. And then all we have to do in order to update the local storage is uh, call that same tag, which is like the address or like the cubby address that we defined, and you just swap out the old uh, variable uh, content with a new one. So we're just overriding it basically. Uh, so you can think about it as we had something that's old and we basically completely removed that, we're basically deleting it and then just copying a new uh, updated version to this, uh, a cubby address. And then we just uh, want to also reset the text of the text box to a blank string to reset it. Okay. Also, awesome, awesome job as well, Aiden. You guys are uh, already ahead of the game here. So let's just, uh, it's already 620. So we'll just uh, do this. But uh, we can also, again, do something similar. Uh, copy this. We have the erase item button. And when we click on that, we want to um, make sure that the user has removed a value uh, or selected a value to be removed. We want to then remove it and then again, update the visual stuff. So um, we'll just do this. And this is basically how we make it. So we'll just make it real quick. <clears throat> so this is gonna check for if the user has selected stuff. The selection index, I think we used this yesterday also gives a Boolean or like a conditional. Um, well, in this case, it's I think uh, zero or one. We'll, we'll double check it in the info, but uh, as long as it is selected, then we can actually then proceed. So we'll go to the to-do list, make sure something is selected. So we'll go here, selection, I think here somewhere. Yeah, selection, uh, and then go to math. Get the comparison. Get a number, in this case, zero. <clears throat> and then in this case, we're just uh, following the steps that we already have. Um, and we could, like earlier, put this at the bottom. Um, one thing to note is that the order here uh, is we just want to make sure that we're setting after we make a specific change um, that's relevant. In this case, we want to make sure this is first but these are uh, interchangeable with uh, each other because um, this is the only change we make and these are basically just storing how we can view slash access them, if that makes sense. Um, so then we'll go to here, remove the items in the list. The specific list we want is the only list we've actually defined and we can remove the specific selection index, which um, again, gives what we want. And I actually realized this is selection index. So what the logic here actually, sorry, is that we're taking the index of uh, the list. Um, and since MIT App Inventor doesn't start at zero, um, we can just make sure that as long as it's not equal to zero, that means that it is a valid index um, because it also wouldn't go you know, negative. There are no negative indices we've defined. So you know if there are three items, it's the indices are one, two, three, but there's no zero index. Um, which again is different than like something like Python. Um, but from here, uh, we just have to grab the index uh, of that value that was been selected and we can just delete it from here, um, for example. So uh, for instance, if we have like a grid one, two, three, so we'll just grab around the cars here, one, two, three. This is index one, one, this is index two and index three. If we've specified this function index as two, we're deleting the second one. So relatively straightforward stuff. Okay, so then from here, we can also set the to-do list view. Uh, 
uh, the elements in the selection index. Properly. So doing that real quick. Just copy this value. And this value. Um, let's make sure that we have everything that's actually uh, missing. So we should have everything for this button. And I'll also speed run the next one uh, as well. And let's check the chat here. Okay, awesome, Aiden. Uh, good job for getting that uh, all done. So here we'll make the uh, clear all button. All it does is we, we just want to clear everything. We just set everything to either empty or zero, um, or use the clear functionality. So copy this. Delete this inside part, change it to the clear all button. <laughs> and then we just want to set everything to be empty basically. So here we're setting it to an empty list to reset it. For the list view, we again want to make this empty as well. So we grab the elements, which are you know, basically the contents. Also set that as an empty list rather than this here. Although we probably could just grab this value again because we've already made this empty, but this does the same thing. Um, and then we can call the clear tag, excuse me, and specify the specific tag or, you know, address basically. Address label is probably a better way to describe it rather than like a pure address. But we can then take that and uh, define that as like the name of the address to, to delete. So, okay, I think at this point, this should be working. Uh, let me connect the tablet. Uh, and in this case, make sure that you've caught up with all the code here. And we'll test to make sure that we don't have any bugs or anything. And we'll also have someone showcase their code uh, to you um, know, give us an example for the class. What's up? Could I see the bottom of the like, the one clear all button dot click, is it just creating two empty lists? Yeah, basically. So we're basically taking the to-do list we've defined and emptying it, make okay. it make a new I think, I think I missed the last two lines. Yeah, no worries. So um, you can also uh, just take the empty list here. Um, you could technically also put one of these here since we've already defined this as an empty list again, uh, just for consistency of logic because we always want to set these elements as that local variable that we've uh, defined. But you know, this achieves the same thing uh, in theory. And again, yeah, all this code is in the tutorial uh, if you want to follow along. But let me connect this thing here. And we'll connect. Stop the share for the time being. <clears throat> um, this thing should connect as well because it disconnected. But in the meantime, uh, if you're behind or if you know, say you doze off a bit and you want to uh, ask some questions, you know, feel free to ask away, and we can answer them at this time. Okay, so we've got this demo up. It's actually not showing the uh, screen one, so there is a bug here somewhere, but we'll test this out here. Hey. Oh, uh, John. Yes, what? When you start, when you scan the uh, QR code, make sure the screen one is on. Oh, when you, oh, right. you, you should it as a default. Okay. I'll redo uh, that. Also, um, there's a runtime error which says 
the operation remove list item cannot accept the arguments a empty string no you will not see another error reported for five seconds uh we'll look at that uh and see what the error is chances are it was just a small thing um from our end let me redo this and set screen one as the main one so uh dr Meng, you said that it's supposed to uh yes just bring the screen one on the top okay. and then you create the qr code oh right right so i gotta select screen one sorry about that okay so put this here and now we'll share this again okay perfect sorry about that um so and again to reiterate what we just did um we have to create the companion when screen one is selected uh so that it'll default uh show screen one as our screen uh, because we didn't route it so that screen two would show from screen one. Um, so in this case, we define the password as one, two, three, four. That allows us to access. And from here, we could say, hey, enter an item, click this, erase an item. Their operation cannot uh, Read a book, remove it. Write an essay, do math, something like that. So the uh, remove item says it can't accept the argument. So we'll just double check um, what the issue was. So um, what we can do here is I should just compare with the code here. We don't see your screen. Yeah, yeah, I uh, will share right here. So we have this and uh, let's see if it just matches first. It's just an index. Uh, it just should have been a selection index uh, rather than the selection. So the what well, we basically the mistake that I made here uh, was that uh, we're supposed to pass in the index so that we could delete the item um, of that index. So again, basically what that could be is like we have three uh, circles. We want to remove the second circle. We don't pass the value of that circle. We pass the the order. So in this case, number two rather than the actual uh, uh, value itself. So. Uh, from here, we should be able to reload it and it should work now. So let me reset the connection, click the companion, and share the AirDroid. For, for the companion, at least for me, I'm pretty sure you don't have to reset the connection every time you change a piece of code. Yeah, you should be able to do it. For some reason, my, my connection doesn't, it just takes too long, so I just do this. Um, oh, all right. But yeah, like I mentioned, I think in the first one, it usually lets you just uh, uh, refresh live. Um, so you don't have to reset it every time, which takes uh, you know an extra second or so. And let me actually redo, uh, actually it's not a big deal. We'll just show screen two. Um, so we'll go here and we can type in, actually, since this is still, I think in the same runtime, we can just, we should be able to just delete it and it seems to work here. Uh, it gave an error. We'll uh, look at that in a bit, but we'll test the other functionality. Hey, hey, and hey again, I'll misspell it and you should be able to just clear it off. So erase item still has an error. So we'll just uh, double check what it is. Enter item, erase item. The arguments my to-do list sort of wrong. Uh, did this say order? The wrong number of arguments for store values. So we'll see uh, what that is. Most likely, um, something was uh, recorded wrong. So, wrong number of arguments for store value. So, store value here is just uh, missing a value to store. So, I mean, in this case, we just want to uh, store the updated uh, global to do list with the um, value removed. So, um, that's that's all, uh, and it should work now uh, because I think everything else is. Uh, also, I got a runtime error that said remove list item attempted to remove item zero of the list. Hey, the minimum valid item number is a one. Yeah. Um, did you? Uh, does your code match this here? Um, does not equal to my to do list global set to zero. Get 
dot elements to get global to do list. Remove this selection index, get global to do list. So, oh, wait. I have selection instead of selection index. Yeah, it should be selection index. I think I put selection here earlier, so that was my fault. Yeah, also, but what was the other error that you were talking about? Because I was trying uh, to So what it did was um it it uh we are deleting it, right? So it'll show up as deleted because we set this after. Um, but the issue is um uh, I forgot to store a value here. So it was storing basically like a null value, it just wasn't uh, doing anything. Was, oh. Oh, okay. Or actually, power was even storing a null value, so actually just giving an error. Um, so uh, from here, you can just re-update it, and all this is doing is taking this updated global to-do list that has removed the item at that index, and then uh, sending it to the new uh, location in the database. Or sorry, old location with the new contents. Okay, so that was um, a bit more complex than the earlier projects. Um, so slightly more room for small mistakes. So um, if you guys are running into any errors, uh, please feel free to uh, you know put it in the chat or we can answer them right now. Uh, since you said background color to zero, yeah, that should be selection index to zero. That's my bad. So we select selection index to zero um, in order to uh, Basically, uh, I'm pretty sure just remove that basically from there. Um, so that this, if doesn't trigger again. Okay. Uh, if, you're asking what I mean by what I just said. Um, what that basically does is earlier we have something selected, right? So we have like the list, um, say it's like index one, two, three, four. Since we're starting at one, um, if we just left the index at one because a user selected one, then this would trigger again because uh, we didn't update that it is no longer selected. So all we're doing is we're just redefining that the uh, selection index should go back to zero because it doesn't do it by itself. Um, so that nothing is selected. Hello. Hello. What's up? This thing. Hello. Hello. What's hello. up? Uh, hi. hi. Um, John and uh, Dr. Ming. Sorry, I have to leave like half an hour alert early because uh, one of my classes is basically just crossing over this class so i have to leave now sorry no worries uh, but, thank you for your time alice and have a nice day all right thank you Bye. catch up with the video i will i will thank you okay so do we have any more questions any bugs we're running into that we can troubleshoot Okay, um, looks like we're good then. And um, we'll move on to the second project. We probably won't be able to finish it, but we can get a start and then you guys could uh, work on the project on your- Yeah, just own. by the way, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, John, can you publish to the gallery and share yes, the link with us? can do. So uh, to publish, you can post this. I logged in yesterday, so this should work. Um, but this is just a code, uh, it should be working. If it gives you any more errors, let me know. Uh, I probably just, uh, while I was talking, forgot to change some of these, like one or two things, but uh, I can update it and uh, get that fixed. But in general, you can also follow the uh, steps here and it should work too. But this can serve as a working reference. So we'll just say that this is an app or say day three app demo. This file, and we can just again pick this random background, submit it, and I'll put this in the Discord for you guys to access. And I'll put it in this chat as well.
Okay, so um, we'll move on to the next project for today. Let me just put this in the Discord real quick. I'll put it in general. I treat general is not the best place, but I'll put it under discussions. And from here, we can also work on the next project, which covers cloud DB topics. It's relatively similar, um, same principles. Um, most likely, the cloud stuff is probably going to be more useful for you if you're making um, shareable projects, uh, as in content that is shareable within the app. Um, so this would be nice to um, you know work around with. So we'll start here uh, and see how much we can get done in around 20 minutes. Uh, and if we don't finish, then you guys can also um, finish it on your own time. So let's move on uh, to give a summary for the interface. Um, we have these buttons, you know, ask a poll question, uh, and it, it is, you know, you can just vote your choice and then basically tally it. And the thinking is uh, we can basically connect this to the cloud and collect everyone else's responses in order to, um, you know, make comparisons and see it in real time, you know, see what the group is thinking. If you've ever used, uh, I'm not sure if you guys have used this in school yet, but there are websites like pollev.com, and usually you can have a teacher like broadcast a question to the whole class and then you know see what percent of each class is voting uh, for a specific answer choice for example this is basically the same concept and i'm sure if you have you know viewed any elections recently you've seen this on tv as well um <clears throat> so this is just you know simple interface so uh, we will move on to the implementation here uh so um App Inventor is asking us to connect the companion and see if the interface actually looks good. Um, I think we're good. We are running short on time, so we'll skip over this, but um, well, it should look fine because it's just following the parent, although maybe say some things might be a little scrunched. But uh, if you're using a big tablet, it generally should be OK um, in terms of the aspect uh, ratio. Uh, so we'll use CloudDB again. What CloudDB does is, is it makes data viewable for other users and devices. Um, which is useful if you're trying to make comparisons like this, right? Uh, so you can basically share the data. Um, but it does, in theory, lead to potential, um, uh, you know, data leakage, but also security concerns. Um, and it could also be more expensive um, and slightly less safe, say, if whoever is hosting your data decides one day to just stop hosting it. Um, but, you know, generally, those are things that are not Real life concerns are mostly concerns um, in principle. So TinyDB is similar to CloudDB. Uh, <clears throat> we can still store a value, we can append a value to the list, and we can grab a value as well. Um, and we can also, you know, if we uh, make it, made a call, uh, the, the main difference here is that uh, it, it doesn't happen instantaneously. We have to uh, give it some time. Uh, generally speaking, that's because we can't just access locally on a device like ASAP. Uh, we have to make sure that it's communicating back and forth. That takes a bit of time and adds some latency. Um, but you know, it, that in practice, it's probably not that much slower, especially with like very fast Wi-Fi. Um, we're also you know very fast 5G connections. Uh, but that is also something to think about is speed. Uh, but you can also have like a return to give like a specific notification once it's received, um, and also. Uh, um, you know, you have other functionality that comes with the latency as well that uh, uh, it makes makes it uh, different from the tiny DB. So uh, we'll use Cloud DB as a database to store those. So if you kind of uh, previewed earlier, um, and we have the UI at the bottom to tally up those votes um, and make those comparisons. So let us uh, go to the blocks here and initialize these variables. So. <clears throat> the variables we're going to count are going to be the specific counts for yes and no, as well as the percentages. So um, let us initialize these. And have no count. Initialize this.
percentage. And we'll just initialize these with an initial value of zero. And these values uh, can be used uh, to keep track of stuff uh, as we go. So um, from here, we can now define a procedure. So we just have a procedure that we want to call with a do, um, which doesn't return anything because otherwise uh, it could return a specific value, like a result, um, which we could then access. But in this case, we don't want it to actually return anything. We just want it to perform a specific action. Because um, otherwise, you know, if we're returning a value for no reason, then uh, that is not helpful. So we'll do this. And again, like we discussed, I think two days ago, the reason why we make this procedure is, is in order to uh, abstract things and make things simpler. We just have to call the procedure's name instead of having to, you know, run, say, dozens of lines of code and copy paste them every time. It basically just uh, saves the effort for us. So uh, we can, uh, I think they want us to name this as initialize, yeah. And uh, this is just the procedure. Uh, and from here we can set, we'll just show the solution. We can set the poll question label to the thing here. Um, we can set the enable to true, true. Uh, and just basically this is just, um, uh, starting it if that makes sense so uh for example we're taking everything and starting at zero for the bars um on the screen and we can also set the exact percentages slash values as zero as well to start it over so um when we whenever we call initialize this can kind of in a way act as like a uh, reset of sorts um when we make it so uh my bad actually start stopped sharing the screen but uh, that's what we have here. So let me close this and we'll just follow what it says here in order to make this uh, and follow the uh, uh, the initialization. So just to reiterate, it basically is taking the question that we want um, <clears throat> and then we can start voting and then compare across users um, who have access to this uh, cloud functionality. So let's start here. Um, this will take a bit of time, uh, but what we have to do is just find each of the values, poll question label, for example, uh, set this to um, we just want to set this to the actual question uh, uh, command, not the question itself, just the what we want to tell the user to do. So we'll say enter your poll question here. And then we can also set uh, the yes button that enable to true. No button that enable to true. And here we can just grab Boolean values true here, copy it. We can set the graph button to true so we can show the graph. Copy this over as well. So. Actually, the order that they show puts this above and gives. We want to actually also set the text to show graph. I'm going to set this to actually false. Um, and then let's make sure that we uh, did not gloss over anything. False here. And then visible to false. Set horizontal arrangement. Dot visible. And set this to true or solid false. And then we can also set these variables to zero just to restart them. So we we'll just copy this four times because you have four variables. And we can just, you know, go in order. Copy this. Set this to zero.
And then we can set these final three, th four things to zero as well. So yes, bar. With percent. No bar with percent to zero again. And then we can set the text of them, or not them specifically, but the text of the labels that they have, which will tell us the values to zero as well. So you can double check this here uh, to make sure we didn't skip over anything, but we basically initialize or reinitialize all these to zero. Uh, we set these to false, true, and then these are just in general um, text that we have. So we'll give a second forever to catch up since that was a lot of stuff to add in a single uh, procedure. But again, this kind of shows us why uh, calling a procedure is useful because if we um, define the procedure here, we don't have to recopy this every time. And of course, if we have to duplicate uh, this whole thing, you know, every single time we wanted to call, initialization would get very bulky. But you know, thankfully we have this to uh, save space. So from here, we can actually collapse. I think we just press this gear or double tap it. Excuse me. Uh, and then from here, um, this again just makes everything look cleaner, um, and less unwieldy. So from here, uh, we can set a screen one initialization. So oh, things should be that text that with percent. Oh yeah, my bad. Thank yeah. you for catching that. Can you show the initialize? Because I, I think I have sure, a... Sure, sure, sure. It should be that text, my bad. I skipped over that. Because uh, obviously we're, the label is text. It's not a width percentage. Um, so we just changed the text here, um, which in this case uh, is just here. Oh yeah, I think you guys can move on. Okay, so we'll move on here. Um, and when we want the, when the screen one initializes, uh, we want to just call this, uh, we'll just collapse this again. Um, and then we want to make a request uh, for this spe specific tag, make another request for the other tag. Um, and then we can just get the existing values as well uh, from the other users uh, on the specific screen. So. Um, we'll just walk through this uh, logically. So we want to get one screen one initializes. You know, we want to make a get value request to CloudDB. Um, and we can then specify the tag as well as the uh, value. So we'll just show this here. And this is the specific implementation. Like I said before, we can call the value, get that specific tag it mentioned specific tag I mentioned again. And if nothing is there, we can then uh, create an empty list to substitute it. So we'll go here, call the only function we've actually defined. And then we'll go to the cloud DB thing here, call this, call this again. And then we will go to text. Yes, folks. No votes. And if nothing is there, create an empty list. Empty list again. And then we are finished with this part. So uh, when we have the response again, like it showed us earlier, we can actually uh, get the got value and we should be able to then do something else once the values are to receive to use them. Otherwise, if we use them prematurely, um, we could get an error since it uh, doesn't actually have anything assigned. So in this case, uh, they want us to do this. Um, so we're basically making a statement, you know, if the tag is a specifically yes votes, because, you know, we have two different uh, responses that we get, one for yes votes, one for no votes. Um, and uh, we can then just grab the value of that response with that specific tag, and then just uh, update the uh, variable of yes count, no count live with respect to all the other users on the network. Um, in cloud db so what we'll do here is we'll go control get if then else 
And then uh, here we have another logic thing. So this logic uh, equal sign is different than the math. Uh, this is how we compare to Booleans. Whereas here we're comparing two numbers, just as a note. Um, and again, Booleans are like true false labels, which are a little bit different. So we'll get the tag. I should copy this. Oh wait, actually, you want us to use an if then and an else if. So we can actually add an else if right here. Okay, wait, this is trippy. So else and then else if. Yeah, yeah wait, sorry, I'm, I'm bugging. That's the regular order. And then from here, we can just grab the text. And again, these are the tags that are specific here. Wait, how did you add that else if? So what you can do is uh, click on this gear icon. And the else if is basically a secondary condition outside of the regular if. And then the else is just if, you know, every, any other case. Uh, generally speaking, in this case, that would be like a bug or, you know, some unintended behavior. Um, but, uh, you know, this is what we have here. Actually, they didn't even want us to have it else. I think they're assuming that we have always intended behavior. So we just leave that here. So to reiterate how you do it, you click on the gear and you can drag and drop stuff out. So from here, then we can copy the no votes, add that here. And then we want to set, or if you hear my dog in the background, he just keeps barking for some reason. Uh, yes count here and then no count. And then get the length of the list. And we just want to grab the specific value that was returned. This value. So let's double check to make sure we didn't miss anything and to re explain what this is doing exactly uh, to serve as an example for you guys. Uh, but we need this because the cloud DB doesn't happen instantaneously. So we need a way to get a response. In practice, this latency, uh, like this basically gap time is probably not that large. But um, you know, in the past it was probably bigger. Uh, but you know, in case you have an exceptionally large request or you know things just process slowly, you only want to actually change stuff once you know you get confirmation that things uh, were received on the other side. So in this case, we're checking <laughs> two different responses and splitting them up based on the tag. You know, one contains data for yes votes, one has for no votes, and then we just update uh, the number in this case uh, based on this. Uh, response. So you need to make a procedure. Um, and to make a procedure, just go here. And you basically tag, drag and drop this here. And then, uh, you know, you want to follow the steps here. It's a bit long. And uh, make sure not to, you know, miss anything here. But if it won't show up unless you've already made it. So we've made two different procedures. And for example, if I delete this, then this should disappear once we click on it again. Uh, what's up leon oh my bad um i think i was unmuted no worries okay so we'll move on here and we'll have we have yes and no buttons uh that we also have so we'll add functionality for when these are clicked and this might be the last thing we're able to do uh before uh i think time runs up but we'll just make them real quick Basically, when we click on this, uh, it says here it's set to true initially. Uh, I think that's mostly just as an example because we don't want it to be enabled originally. Um, but I, I think uh, uh, the intuition is this is just for testing or development. Whereas uh, later on, if we set it to false, they can only test, basically give a one vote because uh, then I think it just then it is left as. Uh, wait, actually, let's run this through. These are true initially. Um, probably should say this, uh, so I think then it would, uh, when you click on it, uh, it sets to false. And then you can't use it anymore because it's no longer enabled, which would only let you uh, submit one vote. Otherwise, uh, you know, if it's true, it's, it's always true when you click it, then it could let you give as many votes as you want. So that's just for testing purposes. Um, for the sake of, since honestly, it doesn't really matter for us, we'll just leave it as false uh, instead of true. Um, so let me get the 
uh, vote button, or excuse me, yes button. Uh, a long click note, we want a normal click. So we have this here, and then we can set the uh, yes button and no buttons and the enable aspects. And we want, and we'll just for the time being set these defaults so that they can only submit one vote. Okay, I'm just gonna do this. And then we can call the uh, API. And then append this to, since this is the yes button, get this tag and add a yes to their thing. Double check that nothing was missing. And again, for uh, why we do this, when we click on this, we want to disable the button so that they can no longer vote more than once. And then we want to append to this specific tag, um, or, you know, like we defined it earlier, or like, you know, label location and just add a yes to it. Uh, honestly, for no button, we can just take this, uh, change this to no button, do the same thing, and just change this to no votes, I believe. No. So this gives us a bulk of the, uh, 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 the functionality, it's almost seven. So I don't think we can, we will finish this up here quite yeah, yet. Yeah, John, uh, how mm -hmm. about this? If you can uh, publish to the gallery right. and send it to everyone so we can continue on it. Yeah, sounds good. Afterwards, yeah. Afterwards. So, we'll, so we will publish this here and then you can continue where we left off and you can just follow the guidelines here. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, just feel free to put it in the Discord. I'll be there to help out. So uh, we'll call this video or day three, demo, demo two. And submit this to my apps. And then it is the opinion poll. And now I will share this in the Discord and the chat for you guys to uh, finish and use as a sample thing. So link to the second demo we made today. Unfinished. Okay, and it's seven now. Um, so, you know, thank you guys for your time today, as well as for coming the last two days um, out of your uh, summer. But, you know, you guys are free to go, obviously, not at seven. But, uh, you know, if you have any questions, just feel free to put it in the Discord and love to chat there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ming, as well, for organizing this. Uh, and again, if you have, you know, anything, thank you, Ambrose, as well. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to just uh, email or I uh, just put it in the Discord is probably preferable. See you guys.